until I was 27 years of age. Didn't get to know any. But the heavens, they spoke to me. And I was born in Montreal. My father had a very successful engineering business there. Uh, but he had an unscrupulous financial partner who basically ran off with all the resources of the company. And in one day, my father had to lay off 40 employees, dozens of engineers. And uh, with the last few dollars he had, he took our family out of Montreal and moved us to Vancouver. He couldn't find work because even though he had all these engineers working for him, he didn't have any formal education. And so we had to resettle in Vancouver. We settled in the poorest neighborhood in Vancouver. But it turned out to be a blessing in disguise because I'm on the autistic spectrum. I was not talking. I had very poor motor skills. I couldn't hold a pencil or a pen. And uh, all my parents' friends had diagnosed me as mentally retarded. I would have been put in a special school if we'd stayed in Montreal. But we had settled in this immigrant neighborhood of Vancouver. Uh, people from all over the world, refugees. And they were like me. They weren't speaking English. They were learning a new language. So I kind of fit in. But I tell you, I almost failed grade one because I couldn't prove that I could read. I couldn't prove that I could do mathematics because I couldn't hold a pencil. And, uh, but it was a teacher that held me after school one day and said, you don't have to talk. I'm just going to ask you questions, nod your head or shake your head. She figured out even though I wasn't talking, I could read. She put me into the second grade. And I don't know what it's like here in the US, but in Canada, they seat you in the classroom according to your academic standing. And so I was in the last chair in grade two. Uh, but I kind of figured out what was going on, and I said, I better learn how to talk. And so I would go home and practice holding a pencil for hours so I could actually make the letters and numbers. And within the grade two, I was in the first chair. Now, also at seven years of age, I started talking, and I began to ask questions. I remember one night I had a conversation with my parents. Are the stars hot? And they said, son, yes, they are hot. I said, why are they hot? And they said, you better go to the library. So they gave me bus fare. I went all by myself to the Vancouver Public Library, which had a four million volume set. And I came home with five uh, books on astronomy and physics. In fact, that happened every weekend. I would come home with another set of uh, books. So astronomy captured me and fascinated me ever since I was seven. I knew that was going to be my future career, uh, literally from that point uh, forward. But it wasn't enough for me to study astronomy. I wanted to do astronomy. And so in our neighborhood, there were a lot of drunks. And so I would go around collecting empty beer bottles. They were worth one and a half cents each. And uh, soda pop bottles were worth two cents. So for seven years, I collected beer bottles and soft drink bottles until I had enough money to buy a telescope mirror and some metal parts. And because my dad was a machinist, he helped me build a telescope. And so from the age of 15 onwards, I had this telescope and I used it uh, to do a research study on variable stars. I joined the uh, Royal Astronomical Society of Canada and uh, they made me the uh, director of observations at age 16. And that required me giving lectures at the university, so I started giving lectures. And that helped me with my autism, being able to communicate uh, with people. And, uh, but age 16 is also when I'd spent uh, a long study on cosmology, the origin and structure of the universe, and recognize that the Big Bang explanation really was fitting the observations. And so with this Big Bang, that means there's a beginning. If there's a beginning, there's got to be a beginner. So at age 16, I realized there had to be some kind of God behind the universe. So what did I do? I began to read the great philosophers. Started off with Immanuel Kant, René Descartes, but quickly discovered that their ideas about the universe were not comporting with their observations. So I began to look in other sources for insight about this God that was behind the heavens. So I remember looking at the, the Hindu Vedas, but they were speaking about multiple beginnings for the universe rather than just one. And uh, the idea of uh, the entropy in the universe wasn't fitting what they were saying. And in the wrong time scale in the universe. Uh, the high school I went to was mostly Asians, uh, refugees from Asia, a lot of Buddhists. So I checked out the Buddhist commentaries. 
um, basically saying the same thing as Hindus about the universe, checked out Islam, found that the accounts they had of uh, creation were contradicting one another. Finally, I did check out the Bible. Now, what I told you earlier, I didn't get to know Christians till I was 27. I actually got to see two from 30 feet away when I was 11 years of age. They were Gideons that came into our public school. And this is the Gideon Bible I got when I was 11. But I didn't touch it until I was 17. And when I began to go through it, I realized this book is really different. Uh, it's clear, it's direct, it's not repetitive. Uh, it's not you know, this appeal to intellectual snobbery. And after studying it for 18 months, I realized I couldn't find a single provable or error contradiction in this book. I found things I didn't understand, but I could not discover any provable error or contradiction, unlike what I found in these other sources. At the same time, I discovered this book in many places was predicting future scientific discoveries. Uh, things like the universe having a space-time beginning, expansion of the universe under constant laws of physics, or one is a pervasive law of decay, which implied that we must live in a universe that gets progressively colder and colder with respect to time. At Genesis 1, I realized here's all these events of creation. They're all correctly described. They're all in the correct chronological sequence. Also discovered this book accurately predicted future historical events. And I remember one night at age 19 calculating the probability that these statements about future science and history could have been recorded by people who are not inspired by the one who's in control of history and who created the universe, and recognize that this book had a higher degree of reliability than laws of physics that we trust with our lives literally every minute of the day. And so August 6, 1964, I began praying as I looked over this Gideon Bible and realized if I make a commitment of my life to Jesus Christ, if I sign my name in the back of this Gideon Bible, I'm committing myself to share my Christian faith with others. And I realized what kind of attack I would come under if I did that. So I literally prayed for about a five hour period. But at 105 in the morning, I signed my name in the back of this Gideon Bible and said, I don't care what kind of persecution or attack I face, I'm gonna be a witness for Christ. A few days later, my best friend and lab partner, John Sampson, who later became the chairman of the physics department at the University of Alberta, he came up to me early one afternoon and said, Hugh, I need to talk to somebody. I need to talk to somebody about God. Do you know anybody in this campus that knows anything about God? And I says, well, I just discovered him a few weeks ago. And so we wound up having about a four hour conversation that afternoon. That led me to recognize Ephesians 2.10, how that uh, God prepares good works in advance for us to do. He's the one that paves the way and opens the door. So I got to share my Christian faith with a number of students, even some of my professors went on to the University of Toronto. In Toronto, I tried to find Christians. I went into churches, but every church I tried was either a church where nobody believed the Bible uh, was the word of God, uh, or it was a cult. And uh, then I went on to uh, Caltech. And at Caltech, Many of the astronomers are some of the world's most famous astronomers were Christians. And, uh, but there was a lot of atheists there too. And in fact, I shared an office with an atheist astronomer from uh, Australia. And every day, he would pick a fight with me on the Bible and science. And he would ridicule what I shared with them with the rest of the atheist professors there. But there was a day after about a year, literally every day was going on, but then there was a day where he walked into the coffee room and said, I no longer can ridicule the Bible or Hugh Ross because last night I gave my life to Jesus Christ. And I saw that happen with others, engineers and scientists at Caltech. But there's a Christian astronomer there by the name of Dave Rogstad, and he says, Hugh, have you ever thought about sharing your knowledge about science and faith and the Bible with non-scientists? I said, well, where do you find these non-scientists? And he says, if you go about two miles off the Caltech campus, I'm sure you'll find plenty of them. And so I did that. And um, I literally would just knock on people's doors and start talking um, you know, to strangers and discovered how many of them were very eager to talk about the Bible and science. I saw many come to Christ right on their doorsteps. 
planted Bible studies, got the Bible studies together, eventually planted a church. In fact, Dave Rogstad became one of the pastors of that uh, church uh, that we had uh, planted. Then I began to get speaking engagements, uh, not just in California, but around the U.S. and literally the world. I started writing a book, and then the elders at our church said, we want to help you launch an organization. That was the birth of Reasons to Believe. And the whole heart of Reasons to Believe is to equip people with brand new evidences from the frontiers of science that Jesus Christ is Creator, Lord, and Savior. Why? Because we believe that if you will equip yourself with these good reasons, God will supernaturally bring people to you that are prepared to hear those good reasons. Now, let me just give you a quick story. I was on an airplane once, and this gentleman sat down beside me, shook my hand, and immediately introduced himself as a quantum physicist. Then he immediately also added, I'm an atheist and a skeptic. Now, that rarely happens where somebody tells me they're an atheist and a skeptic right off the bat, but he did. And he said, well, who are you? And I said, well, I'm not a quantum physicist. Uh, I'm more into astrophysics, and I'm not an atheist. I'm a Christian. And he says, oh, uh, well, what do you do with the size of the universe? It seems like such a waste. So I answered that question, and he says, well, what about why would God need 13.8 billion years? Answered that question. He had eight major objections to the Christian faith. We talked about that over the course of a two-hour flight. As we were walking off the flight towards baggage claim, he says, how is it that you know the answers to these eight questions? And I said, well, those are the first eight chapters in a book I wrote a year ago. And he said, do you have a copy of that book? So I showed him, looked at the table of contents. You're right, these are the first eight chapters. I can't believe it. And as we were continuing the baggage claim, he calculated the probability that a German quantum physicist who's an atheist skeptic would happen to be sitting on an airplane flight with an astrophysicist who's a Christian. And he says, it's got to be less than one chance in a billion. And then as we were picking up our bags, he says, I know this day was not an accident. This was planned. And he says, thank you for the book. I was actually able to give him something in German as he walked away. And my message to all of you is, God may not equip you with the same reasons he's equipped me. I remember when we were going door to door, one of the fellows that I had trained uh, came out of the Mormon faith. Well, when he would knock on doors, it was amazing how many times a Mormon or an ex-Mormon would open the door. And when I would knock on doors, it would be an engineer or a scientist. And it's like, this is not an accident. If you prepare good reasons uh, for the hope within you, uh, God will give you an opportunity to share your faith. And this is why I think 1 Peter 3.15 is so dear to my heart. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But this is the point. You need to be able to do this with gentleness, respect, and a clear conscience. If you'll prepare these good reasons and are prepared to share them in a Christian uh, character, God will supernaturally bring people to you. They'll receive those reasons and give their lives to Christ. Thank <laughs> you.